Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to take a look at a very interesting concept, and that is artificial intelligence, a concept that affects basically everybody on planet Earth. I guess is an expert on this topic. Dr. Helga Novotny is former president of the European Research Council, a position she held from 2010 to 2013, and she's also one of its founding members. She is Professor Emerita of Science and Technology Studies, ETH Zurich. Recently, she authored a book titled, In AI We Trust, Power, Illusion, and Control of Predictive Algorithms. Dr. Helga Novotny, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me and good evening from my side. I appreciate you being with me today. We're going to get into your very interesting book in just a minute, but if you could share a little bit of background on the European Research Council. What is it? When was it formed? Why was it formed? With great pleasure. The European Research Council was founded in 2007. And it was a wish that many scientists had in Europe, but I think also around the world, to set up a research funding agency funding only basic research. You could also speak of curiosity driven research. And this was happening with money uh, provided by the European Union. But uh, the European Commission had the um, boldness to say we entrust the management of this uh, funding agency to scientists themselves. So I started out as a founding member with uh, 21 colleagues from different European countries. And we were the ones who set uh, up the rules, the regulations, how to fund basic research. Now um, in 2021, 20, uh, there are about 10,000 researchers in Europe, but also from around the world, if they can spend time in Europe to work on their project, who get grants from the European Research Council. And um, it's very much appreciated uh, around the world because it sets very high standards of scientific excellence. And um, it has been a, a true success and scientists very much appreciate it. And allow me just to add one word uh, because we are all very proud that science was able to come up with vaccines uh, in this time of the pandemic within a very short period. And partly this is due to fundamental research that was done you know, decades ago and kept on going and nobody thought this might be useful. And then all of a sudden it turned out um, that this was the basis on which then cooperation between pharma, governments, finance, all came together. And this is why we do have this um, vaccines today, which is our best weapon against the pandemic. I often think of, well, if we had three people in a room, we probably have four definitions of AI. Is there a basic a definition of artificial intelligence or are there several subsets of that definition? Well, there are many definitions, but basically you could say um, it is instructing a machine to do certain operations that human beings can do also, but the machine can do it faster or better in some way. This is why we are using artificial intelligence. But this is a very basic definition. I'm using it as a kind of umbrella term, speaking about digitalization, all the digital machines that we have, including you know, the sensors that we employ um, when we now have these photographs coming back from Mars, uh, you know, exploring perhaps our future in, 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 in outer space. All this is built on artificial intelligence as one of the means of getting information, getting information back from Mars uh, and keeping communication going with all the machines we need in order to get there and to get back. Is there any fear of us losing control of developing this artificial intelligence? I'm sure many of our viewers have seen 2001, A Space Odyssey, 
a movie from back in 1968 about how, about how a computer, HAL, basically took control of everything and basically pulled a little coup d'etat. <laughs> you come right down to it. But is there a fear of that? Well, there are lots of fears around it. And science fiction partly builds on these uh, fears, of course, and it also gives us a, a little bit of excitement. You know, will we be stronger than the machines or will this, the machines overwhelm humans? But realistically speaking, um, it's still humans that abuse the technology and it's not the technology per se. And therefore, I think when we speak about the fear of being controlled by the technology, we first should take a look at who are the humans and what are the humans doing that make us fear that uh, our um, privacy might be abused, that we might be followed in ways that we do not want and have uh, a right not to be followed. Or if you think of facial recognition that is, um, common in, in China, uh, all over the place. While for instance, in Europe now, there is regulation that is still in a draft form that um, would um, sort of um, warn, we are moving into a red zone of risk once we use facial recognition in places where we should not use it. I know your book is very comprehensive. It's very an excellent overview of this issue. What was your main thrust throughout the book that you wanted? To, which point did you want to get to the public by writing this book? Well, you know, there is so much literature out there that I felt um, I wanted to avoid the, the, the trap of falling either into a dystopian camp or an optimistic, uh, nerd like, uh, you know, tech no optimism, everything will be bright, all our problems will be solved. Or on the other hand, um, we will run into enormous difficulties um, because it will um, overtake us and uh, subjugate us. So um, trying to avoid this trap, I thought um, what I find most interesting is the, the predictive algorithms. These are algorithms that are based on data from our past behavior. Uh, no algorithm can see the future. The future remains uncertain. And yet, uh, you know, we are all interested in what will the future bring? What does it hold for us? And the predictive algorithms allow us to see a little bit further, but they are based on data from the past. And they're used in an everyday way. I mean, uh, the whole advertisement industry targets you as a consumer based on your consumer behavior in the past. They know what you, your preferences are. They know um, which restaurants you prefer or what you want to, to, to see or where you want to spend your vacation and what time. So this has become part of our life. And this is based on predictive algorithms. But then you have uh, things that are less um, innocuous when you let um, a predictive algorithm decide uh, on the fate of individuals. For instance, as you do partly in the US in the judiciary system, you know, using predictive algorithm will someone who has come, who has breached the law uh, will this same person, you know, do it again? What is the probability that the person will do it again? And uh, then, you know, the sentence or going, granting bail or not is based on a predictive algorithm. Or it's also used in the educational system. Um, this happened last year in the UK, for instance, when the minister responsible for education use predictive algorithm to correct what he thought was the lenience of graders to admit students to university. And he wanted to correct for that. Uh, he thought they were too lenient because of the pandemic, the students had not been properly taught, etc. And then <clears throat> the predictive algorithm looked at the schools and the individuals 
but it overestimated the scores. So the students coming from schools that were not uh, performing so good, even though the individual was performing well, you know, got downgraded and others who came from good schools but were not so good were upgraded. And this caught an uproar and in the end it had to be canceled. But also in, in health terms, we use predictive algorithms based on our lifestyle. And then, you know, the predictive algorithm says, well, you know, if you continue like this, you may well get um, uh, obesity or you may get uh, cancer uh, due to your lifestyle in, in the past. And what I'm concerned about is that once we forget that it is a predictive algorithm based on data from the past, that it can really predict the future. And this is where these self-fulfilling prophecies come in. Self-fulfilling prophecy means people believe what uh, the future will bring. The, they believe a prediction and then the prediction turns true because they behave accordingly. And then, um, you know, this um, happens, um, one, one example for a self-fulfilling prophecy is the run on the bank, you know, in former times, in the depression, so a rumor starts and then, you know, people start to believe they will no longer be able to take money from their bank accounts, so everyone rushes to the bank and the bank uh, loses the, the ability to be liquid anymore because it cannot uh, pay everyone who wants their money back. So there are many examples of, of this kind. Um, and, and so this, this became my main concern. Um, you know, if we forget that these, um, it's, it's humans, it's uh, we acting, we believing, we uh, still having a way of holding um, and shaping our future rather than a machine or a decision-making mechanisms that tells us what the future will be. And it sounds like predictive algorithms can be positive or they can be negative. And we're going to come back in just a minute to talk Absolutely. about both of those options. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guests. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, a podcast, an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a computer, you like our shows, and you'd like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we're taking a look at a concept that is worldwide, and that is artificial intelligence. My guest is an expert on this topic. Dr. Helga Novotny is former president of the European Research Council, and she recently authored a book titled In AI We Trust, Power, Illusion, and Control of Predictive Algorithms. Dr. Novotny, we were talking about predictive algorithms. This is a, an issue that's gotten tremendous, tremendous discussion uh, I'm sure around the world, but certainly in the United States lately. And, and that has to do with uh, social media. And of course, that's a very broad area when you think of social media. I guess you think of Twitter and uh, Facebook, different entities like that. But there is great concern now about this predictive algorithms and how they're being used in a very negative way, especially in the promotion of misinformation and disinformation when it comes to things like the 2020 election, which was won not by the former president, but, but by the current president, it uh, deals with a wide range of other concepts, especially put out by groups that are, uh, we would call them dysfunctional, I would, uh, we're talking about neo-Nazis, white nationalists, the QAnons, uh, folks like that, and they have a tremendous impact. And the, the information they put out is some of it is just so absolutely insane. You just wonder how anybody could even believe it. But these apparently these predictive algorithms are pushing people into those camps. And Facebook right now is under a withering attack 
because it's not doing much to try to control this. In fact, they're making more money off of it. So they're continuing on with it. How do you view this whole situation? And what, what did I just say that was wrong about Facebook <laughs> that I'll be happy to retract if I, if I was no, wrong? No, no. Um, I, I think um, the world watches you know, with great interest whether um, Facebook, um, which has such a dominant uh, position worldwide, it's used all over the places. Uh, there are some countries where authoritarian regimes, you know, try to um, ban it or, you know, just uh, shut it, shut it down, but for very different reasons, um, because they do not want their citizens to consume information that is not passed through their own filters. But uh, Facebook has um, promised um, that it would somehow monitor uh, the, the, the content, uh, but at the same time, we know it, it lacks um, doing it. And therefore, we have this situation that is very worrisome because, as you rightly say, um, predictive algorithms can um, filter out and show precisely you know, which kind of content reaffirms what people want to believe. So they know about the beliefs of groups of people and then they bombard them with exactly the same content which reinforces uh, their belief. So we have an ongoing um, polarization that um, is um, exacerbated through social media. And if people would actually meet in person, <clears throat> they would discover, you know, maybe we have things in common. But um, if we just communicate through social media, you get uh, hate speech, you get attacks on views of others, and um, you have no moderation. So it, it keeps on driving this, um, this polarization in the social media. And the question is, what can a government do? What can, um, you need laws uh, in order to regulate or <clears throat> to, um, to uh, break up a trust, uh, a monopoly. You need to change the, the trust laws that go back to the 19th century and probably are not up to the 21st century and the technology uh, we have today. So there needs a lot to be done. But I think people start to realize um, that many of the negative effects are really worrisome. And uh, I think although we all are for freedom of expression and freedom of speech, et cetera, you know, there must be limits in terms of what can be done um, by a power that yeah. is beyond control. That, that is the crux of the problem right there. What can be done? And there's a raging debate right now. Some people are saying, well, Facebook is way too powerful. It needs to be broken up into six, eight, 10 entities, other People on the other side say, well, if you break it up without regulation, you'll just have eight entities doing the same type of, uh, not illegal behavior, but certainly immoral behavior to some degree that Facebook is doing right now. So uh, the question, how do you perceive it? Is, do you see a set of solutions or a solution to help deal with that as far as how to make sure that there's a free flow of information and not repress the information but also do it so it's done responsibly. Well, I think it, 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 it needs um, the political will to do something and only a government or governments have the possibility to, uh, to really to, to, to regulate. But you also need um, good laws and good lawmakers because we do not want to suppress social media altogether. Um, so uh, to, uh, to draw the lines and to have um, a very reasonable solution, what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. But I think you know people are uh, are ripe for 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 a solution, and I can only say you know I hope that uh, reason will prevail, and that it's not about suppressing uh, freedom of speech or suppressing um, values that we have but rather seeing the dangers that come from a further fragmentation and polarization of society. Mm -hmm. 
and that's what they're wrestling with and hopefully they'll come to some conclusion i know this has been a topic of discussion at the united nations in governments all probably all around the world in local state regional national governments uh, they're they're really in a quandary as to what to do with it and how to deal with it well, before we move on um, and run out of time that's our big enemy right now with artificial intelligence i'm curious when i think of artificial intelligence you mentioned it earlier about creating machines or robots or whatever to do our work uh, is there are there any studies that show that through the creation of more robots that we're displacing workers i know so many of the assembly lines the automobile lines different ones like that when they shut down for two weeks in the summer they come back and you've got more machines and a need for fewer workers but we're seeing right now an actual decline in qualified workers in many areas especially in the united states but in other countries too but are there studies that show that the machines will put us out of business eventually or machines will be doing open heart surgeries or machines will be doing uh, dental surgery or whatever the case might be well there are lots of studies including historical studies because you know automation is not happening only now in in, in the last couple of years and it always shows that there are old jobs that will certainly uh, become uh, superfluous so there will automation kills jobs but at the same time it creates other jobs but the open question that so far nobody can answer is is there enough time to create new jobs uh, will we be faster in re-educating re-skilling people for the new jobs that will certainly come up um, or will we have uh, some kind of massive unemployment because uh, we don't um, we, we are not able to make the transition fast enough so it's a question of, of timing a question of speed um, because um, obviously we have to educate our children for a world in which you know, the digital workplace will be the norm and not the exception. And this also for manual tasks, because automation, as you rightly say, it's in factories, it's in, um, you know, uh, also in, in the middle class, you know, lawyers will need uh, digital services for things that lawyers used to do before. Surgeons are using digital uh, machines, um, but they still need to be trained as a surgeon in order, and in addition, how to use the digital uh, tools at their disposition. So all this is happening, but are we fast enough in doing it? That's the open question. Earlier today, and I, you may not have even seen this article, so if you haven't, just ignore the question, but I saw that there were 44 countries around the world that are moving towards their own national strategy to deal with artificial intelligence. How do, how do you perceive that? I mean, I guess every country to some degree has some what of a strategy, but this, I didn't have a chance to go into detail on the article, but is that something that we should look into or could be concerned about, or should we try to develop an international strategy or how should that work? Well, I think there are common elements um, that every country faces, like, you know, reskilling the workforce, educating uh, children and the next generation in ways that will enable them to find jobs um, and, and, and jobs that are fulfilling also and not just, um, you know, low skilled uh, jobs. So there are common, uh, there's some common ground. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, strategies are always also done in the national interest. And um, we, we can see it now with the production of chips, um, you know, that have become a very scarce commodity. Uh, who produces um, enough microchips to go into all the sensors and digital devices that are needed? And so, you know, we need, um, and this is what the UN, you know, tries to do in an ideal world uh, to create 
common ground and for nations to be able to act uh, together against climate change, um, et cetera, the, the uh, 17 um, S SDGs, the Sustainability Development Goals is, is another example. At the same time, if we are realistic, we see that also, you know, countries still have their own national interest um, and that be can, can become very strong. And then the strategy is to serve the national interest foremost. Well, Dr. Helga Navande, this is an extremely important topic and it's a very complex topic. It's one we will not be able to resolve overnight or even within a week or, or a month, maybe within a year or whatever, but it's one that we have to deal with because it is not the way of the future, it is now. We are dealing with it and it will become even more accelerated as we move into the future. And so it's good that the various entities are looking at this that the countries of the world are coming together at the United Nations to try to figure out how to utilize this medium, so to speak, in a positive way without suppressing it. That's that I don't think, well, there are a few countries that would like to do that, but generally speaking, most do not want to. But this is a very important topic. And I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I am Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.